Good morning, and welcome to our diocesan online worship for this, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad that you're here. We continue to worship as a diocesan community every Sunday in this online platform. And while some congregations have chosen to have their own services, many more are dependent upon this work that we do. And I'm so grateful for the team that makes this possible and all the hard work that they put into it. I also want to thank you for your prayers for Canon Steve Pay, who is now at home recovering from his surgery. And I ask you to keep praying for him. These are incredible and unbelievable times. But through it all, God is good. God is faithful. Something I learned this week that somebody said to me was that we shouldn't fear this disease, but we should respect it. That makes great sense because we know that Jesus's perfect love casts out fear, but that's not an excuse to check our brains at the door and behave in ways that make us and others more vulnerable. That's why we as a diocesan family have issued clear guidelines for churches during this time. You know they're a challenge help keep everyone safe. We do this because we love our neighbor as our Lord commands. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. be with you and also with you let us pray grant to us Lord we pray the spirit to think and do always those things that are right that we who cannot exist without you 
may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. 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 A reading from the book of 1 Kings. At Horeb, the Mount of God, Elijah came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Yehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Javad, of abel as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes from the sword of Hazael, Yehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Yehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. 
that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came towards Jesus. 
But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. At an interfaith retreat some time ago, the organizers decided to allow for a free afternoon of just socializing. And I don't know about you, but that uh, when I've been on a retreat, that's, that's not something I'm always offered. So a priest, a minister, and a rabbi took them up on it and went fishing together. After they'd been out on the boat a while, the, the priest said, are you all thirsty? I'll go get drinks. Ah, I left the cooler on the shore. So he lays down his fishing pole, steps over the side of the boat, and walks across the water to the shore, picks up the cooler, then walks back across the water to the boat. The minister says, oh, that reminds me. I forgot our lunch. I'll be right back. So he stands up, steps over the side of the boat, and walks right on the top of the water to the shore. He picks up the sack with the lunch and walks right back on the water to the boat. The rabbi was awestruck. Imagine walking on water, he thought to himself. Well, if they can do this, so can I. He excused himself to the priest and the minister, put his pole down, stepped over the side of the boat, and sunk like a rock. The priest turned to the minister and said, You think we should have told him where the rocks were? Now, this joke exists in multiple forms. You can find all sorts of different variations on the internet, including one that casts it as three Buddhist monks. Indeed, it seems like walking on water is one of the best known and often told miracles of Jesus, whether it's told in reverent tones by believers or in a mocking way by skeptics. The idea of walking on water seems to appeal to our human imagination. It's different than most of the miracles. We might be able to explain away a miraculous healing, a feeding of the multitude, or some even try to explain away the resurrection of Lazarus, but this is really a hard one. This is a wonder-provoking occurrence. It's something that doesn't have a ready scientific explanation. If we look at the context, Jesus had sent the disciples away by boat and had withdrawn to pray, and when he returns, a squall has come up, and the disciples are battling the storm out on the sea. And Jesus steps out on the water and approaches the boat. Now Peter, and we know Peter, he's the proverbial man of action. In the readings for the Transfiguration last Thursday, when he was confronted with the vision of Jesus, Moses and Elijah together, Peter proposes a Habitat for Humanity solution. Let's build three houses. Now, he takes action again. He steps out, and as long as his eyes are fixed on Jesus, everything goes well. However, he notices the wind, becomes distracted, and starts to sink. This story always makes me think of Wile E. Coyote. He's all right until he notices precisely what he's doing. Peter then cries out to Jesus, who catches him and helps him into the boat. As long as Peter's eyes and entire attention are fixed on Jesus, he's able to do the impossible. But when he becomes distracted and frightened, when he forgets Jesus as the center of attention, he sinks. Beloved, the real work of the church is walking on water. Everything else that we do is important, but they're not the ends. They're the means. The end we are working for is a miracle, a miraculous transformation of lives and our society. And we should look for nothing less than walking on water. Now, it's very much in vogue for atheist writers such as Richard Dawkins to blame the world's problems on religion, although most of those issues that they cite have other principal causes. But what I've not been able to find an explanation for in their writings is the times when the church has been able to walk on water. Transformations of society that are breathtaking and difficult to explain by normal means. 
the elimination of gladiatorial games in the Roman Empire after the empire became Christian, despite the traditional Roman values of finding unity in ritualized violence. Or William Wilberforce taking on slavery at a time when it was an extremely profitable enterprise that literally kept the British Empire running. Or Mother Teresa transforming the way in which people thought about the poor in India, despite the millennia-long attitudes that their poverty was due to their misdeeds in a previous life. The reasons why these movements worked, the reasons why they were able to walk on water, was because they kept their eyes on Jesus. Wilberforce worked on anti-slavery legislation for his entire life, and the full fruit of the legislation only came to pass after his death. He faced ridicule, threats, and personal disaster, as well as an interior struggle. And we know now from Mother Teresa's diaries what a struggle of faith her confrontation of human suffering created within her. She spent many years in a deep, dark night of the soul. It's important to note that both Wilberforce and Mother Teresa had to confront the institutional church of their day, each of which was loath to support them. Being a person of faith who can transform the world does not mean being someone who always feels God's presence. It means keeping your eyes on Jesus and his teachings, even when you don't feel the way you think you ought to. If our eyes are on Jesus, the results can be breathtaking. If we succumb to the temptation of obsessing about the storm, we risk sinking. But even then, Jesus reaches out to us and pulls us in the boat. The church always has a storm. Different ones for every generation. I've heard people talk over the last couple of decades in the church about how much nastier our current storms have been, but not really. In the late 1800s, Wisconsin was the epicenter of the major storm in the Episcopal Church. In our church's general convention in New York City in 1874, the storm was ritualism, or Catholic ceremonial, that was being reintroduced to Episcopal worship. One has to remember that normative Episcopal worship at the time was very ritually sparse. It was much more similar to, say, Presbyterian worship than Roman Catholic. Certain churches were bringing in practices and ornaments that made people nervous. Our first major schism had happened one year before when the Reformed Episcopal Church split off, one of the major fault lines being churches starting to place candles and flowers on the altar. A new rule was put before the convention that would forbid incense, forbid incense the use of a crucifix anywhere in worship or inside a church, the elevation of the elements of communion, and bowing and genuflection. Also suspicious, but not completely outlawed, were colorful vestments that matched the season. Processions with the cross at the beginning and end of the service and robes for choirs. All these things were considered to be unprotestant or Romish, and even more important to the male leadership of the, of the church at the time, effeminate, as these cartoons illustrate. According to the leadership of the time, Protestants were supposed to be manly, like Peter building houses, at that general convention, James DeCoven spoke at length. He was the president of Racine College, now the DeCoven Center. At the time, it was a nationally renowned Episcopal Institute of Higher Learning. As the acknowledged leader of the ritualist faction, he spoke long and passionately about his own beliefs, but even more importantly, that the church needed to allow for a wide range of doctrinal belief, even for those of his ultra-Protestant debate partners as well. DeCoven paid for his beliefs. He was denied the office of bishop four times despite election by the intervention of his detractors in the church. I love this statue of DeCoven outside the refectory at the DeCoven Center because it has four miters laid at his feet. But his tolerance and gentleness were universally admired. After he died, the General Convention of 1886 meeting in Chicago chartered a train and brought the entire convention to Racine to hold a service to honor him, and he was the first American added to our calendar of saints. His commitment, in, or sorry, he's commemorated in the windows in our Main Street entrance at St. Matthias with the other Wisconsin saints. 
De Coven kept his eyes on Jesus throughout his stormy life. And pretty much everything that he advocated for has become a normative part of the Episcopal Church. He walked on water, and the church is different today because of him. What about the storms in our current lives? Indeed, what isn't a storm right now in public health or politics or a common life? We are tempted to be distracted from Jesus and from the full, empowered, and realized life that he intends for us and for all those around us. The storms tempt us to withdraw from all those around us and instead deal only with labels and stereotypes. The storms of COVID and racial injustice and political polarization make us desperately want to return to normal. But without stretching the metaphor for giant storms too much, normal is always different afterwards. There are all sorts of direct action Christians can take in our current struggles. But if we, as followers of Jesus, do not pay attention to the source of our strength, we will ultimately sink. We're not called to return things to what we called normal before. We are called to refocus our sight on Jesus, cry, Lord, save us, and allow him to pull us into the boat. We are called to weather our storms with Jesus' help, taking what is old and what is new and forging them into something more excellent. Even in the middle of the storms we face today, Jesus tells us, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And we need not ultimately fear. Our Lord reaches out for us. We can walk on the water. We can transform our world if only we dare believe it. Amen. Beloved, let us confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed, saying together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. O oh God, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, in this challenging and uncertain time, we come before you, offering our prayers on behalf of those in need, the church and the world. For the church, that it may not grow weary of proclaiming the gospel of Christ 
and serve as a beacon of hope to a suffering world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our nation and its leaders. Grant our elected officials and civil servants the will to act swiftly and decisively with justice, wisdom, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are ill, may they have access to medical care and regain their strength and health. Grant them your healing grace. Give strength to health care workers and all essential workers and all who are caring for loved ones. Bless all scientists and researchers around the world as they seek a treatment and cure for COVID-19. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who seek justice and those who are charged to maintain order, turn our hearts towards you and towards each other. Show us the way to a just and equitable peace in our society. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who mourn, for those who suffer want and anxiety from lack of work and from the many strains and losses of this time, call us to support one another in love, sharing resources as we are able. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick and lift up all who are brought low, that we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your law. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now in the words our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.
Go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.